Well, if you can join me in John chapter 5 as we are concluding Jesus' words here in this chapter. I've been encouraged already hearing the praise uh, from all of you. Are we doing all right? Don't know? We'll see. <laughs> John chapter 5 in verses 40 through 47, you have Jesus' final words to these religious leaders that hate him. They're hard-hearted. They are against him. But he ends in an interesting way. It's a very instructive passage uh, for us this morning. Because Jesus answers a question here that we've all asked. We've all wondered. Here's the question. Why do people reject the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you ever asked that question? Why do people reject this glorious gospel? Why do people, under the guilt of their sin, reject full forgiveness? Why do people refuse to be reconciled to their creator? Reconciled to the one who made them. Well, that's no good, is it? Let's go with this one. Test? Is this a sign I should be done? Let's hope not. I have a lot to say. <laughs> Back to this question that Jesus is answering. Why would anyone refuse the gospel of Jesus Christ? Uh, interesting to see that there are many folks who spend their days searching for satisfaction, don't they? Everything they do, they're searching for satisfaction. They're searching for life. Jesus says that he has come to give life. Yet there are many who reject that eternal life. To us who believe rejecting Jesus doesn't make any sense, right? We have seen the glory of Christ. We've experienced this reconciliation. The gospel of Jesus is the greatest news ever to be heard. There is a creator. Creator God, he is holy he is transcendent. Yet even still, he sends his son to this earth. He sends his son in grace. Undeserved favor. He sends his son in according to great love. And this son, Jesus Christ, comes. He comes to earth. He lives that sinless life we could never live. But we had to live in order to live in God's presence. He comes to pay for that sin through death. It was a payment we could not pay ourselves. He comes to rise again from the dead. He overcomes death. It was an enemy we could not defeat. Why does he do this? To secure life. To give eternal life life, an eternity we could never earn. Why would anyone reject that good news? Why? Look at verse 24, John 5, 24. You have this glorious gospel summarized in Jesus' words. He's speaking to those who hate him. Truly, truly, I say to you, hear now the greatest news ever he who hears my words, he who believes who I claim to be, that I am the Son of God, I'm Yahweh in human flesh. You hear my words, you believe him who sent me, you believe the Father has eternal life. What kind of life? The life that does not come into judgment, eternal judgment, but instead is passed out of death into Life. That's the message. That's the gospel. Look at verse 34. Verse 34, Jesus summarizing everything that he says. I say these things. What's the reason why I'm speaking these things? So that you may be saved. It's an interesting word. It's sozo, delivered, rescued. But what makes this word saved interesting is that it's used throughout the Old Testament. 
Greek translation of the Old Testament, to describe an action that only God can accomplish. Only God can save mankind. Only God can save the sinner. It shows our hopelessness in and of ourselves, our helplessness. This is the predicament mankind is in, chained to sin. Only God can release him. Held captive in the domain of darkness under the power of a vengeful ruler. Only God can rescue us. We are at war with God. God will always win that war. Mankind is under God's wrath. That wrath will one day fall. So Jesus says in verse 34, I say these things so that you will be rescued, saved from this horrible and helpless predicament. It's the greatest news ever to be proclaimed. You can be reconciled to your creator. You can live forever in his presence. Again, the question, why would anyone ever reject that kind of gospel? Why would someone reject it outrightly or maybe dismiss it in indifference? That's what we're seeing here in John chapter 5. The religious leaders of the land, they are rejecting their Messiah, their Savior, who stands right in front of them. They're rejecting the one who the Old Testament promised, rejecting God the Son incarnate, rejecting the only Savior, the only gospel. I look back to chapter 5, verse 1. It's a sad scene. It's developed. This is just one day in Jesus' life. In verses 1 through 10, we see Jesus with a word of command, heal a man. A man who had been lame for 38 years. Undeniable miracle. It should have brought great joy. Jesus confirming he is the promised Messiah. Verses 19 through 30, Jesus proclaims his arrival. I am the Son. God is my Father. He explains his equality with the Father. He explains that he shares the same divine nature as the Father. This is all in harmony with what the Old Testament promised. That Yahweh would come in human flesh. Jesus says, I am he. And then in verses 31 through 39, Jesus gave irrefutable testimony. That he is who he claimed to be. Indisputable proof. We saw this, verses 31 through 35, he calls John the Baptist to the stand. He's the greatest prophet. The leaders of the land accepted John as a prophet. John says he is, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus calls his miraculous works to the stand. You've all seen them. Fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. And then, as we saw the last two weeks, he called the Old Testament scriptures to the stand. The very scriptures these religious leaders were responsible for defending and studying. He's achieved the highest level of jury prudence. By three witnesses, the matter has been confirmed. He is God the Son incarnate, He is the Savior. His gospel is true. It's the only gospel that saves. Salvation only comes through him. Access to the Father through him. And yet, what do we see in verse 18? These leaders, all the more, were seeking to kill him. They reject their Savior. They plot his death. Again, here's the question, why? Why? Would anyone reject the only Savior from sin? Why? Why would anyone reject God who has come to them? Well, look at verse 40. Jesus answers the question. Here's the answer. Because there's always a cost involved in coming to Jesus. There's always a cost. Verse 40. And you are unwilling to come to me. 
You're unwilling so that you may have life. Oh, the unbelieving sinner wants life, right? That's not the problem. They want life. They want all the blessings that come through Jesus. The unbeliever wants the joy only Jesus can bring. They long for their guilt to be removed. They want hope. They want all of the blessings. Look at verse 39. Even these religious leaders who hate Christ, they're rejecting him. Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You're searching for this reconciled life. You're searching for this forgiveness of sin. But here's the problem. You're unwilling to come to me on my terms. You're unwilling to receive this life by coming to me. Coming to me. That phrase, come to me, it's a call to repentance. You're living away from me traveling in the opposite direction from me. If you're going to have life, you need to come to me, only me, exclusively me. This is repentance. You need to turn. Turn from everything about you, everything about your life that you once lived for, and come to me. If you're going to have life, this eternal life, of the gospel is come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, but do not come to him in a superficial kind of way. No, you come to him as a follower, as a disciple. You come to him counting the cost, understanding the cost involved. Now, what's the cost? What's the cost to come to Jesus? Well, let's put one word on it. Everything. Everything. Everything about you. That's the cost. Here's Mark 8. Here's Jesus later in his ministry. He's going to give this same invitation here. Come to me. He says this, if anyone wishes to come after me. Same wording. Come to me. Come to me to have life. If you're wishing to come after me, there's some conditions. There's some demands, costs. Here they are. He must deny himself. Deny everything about yourself. Relinquish your own personal autonomy. Let go of all self-glory that you once lived for. You must find your identity in him, not in yourself any longer, in him. And you must take up the cross. Love Christ more than your own earthly life. And you must follow me. You're coming to him. Now you must follow him. Follow after him. You go where Jesus goes. You love what Jesus loves. He's your leader. You live in submission to him. You're his follower. So this is why the religious leaders are rejecting Jesus on this day. They're unwilling to come to Jesus on his terms. The cost is too high. If what he said about himself was true, if he truly is Yahweh in human flesh, they then must follow him, right? He's God. He's greater. He's creator. They must follow him. They must find their identity in him. They must give up all of their self-glory. But they will not do that. The cost is too high. Let's draw some application here. Understand that when someone rejects Jesus, when someone rejects the gospel, it's not because of a lack of information about Jesus. That's not the problem. It's not because there's not enough evidence to substantiate his claims of who he is. It's not that the blessings aren't great enough or good enough to come to him. Oh, they are. No one, no one has truly rejected Jesus because they have not had all their questions answered. No one. Rejecting Christ and his gospel is not an intellectual issue. 
It's not an evidence issue. It's not a blessing issue. It's a heart issue. It's in the heart. It's on the inside. It lies much deeper than the mind being satisfied. It's the will. That's what Jesus says. You are unwilling. It's a will issue. You're unwilling to come to me on my terms. You are refusing. It's been a volatile conversation here between Jesus and his enemies. And so here's how he ends the conversation. He explains to them why they're not coming to him, why they're rejecting him, why they are unwilling to believe. And so he's going to turn the tables now. He's going to say, it's not because I haven't given you enough information. Throughout John's gospel, you'll always see this or hear this, show us a sign, right? Show us just one more miracle and then we'll believe. He says, you're not lacking any miracle, any evidence. I've given you enough evidence. He doesn't leave them here thinking that their unbelief was somehow his fault. Jesus ends the conversation by explaining that their unbelief is due to an internal hardness. An unwillingness. To come to Jesus on his terms. We'll look at these terms. Jesus explains them, but we'll see that they're the same terms God has throughout the entire Old Testament. Nothing's new here. They're unwilling to accept the cost involved in coming to Jesus for this life, this eternal life. And they bear the responsibility. They bear the responsibility. Let's read, starting in verse 40. Verse 40, And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. Here's why. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom... You have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? This is how this day ends. Sometimes, this is the only way to end a gospel conversation. Sometimes. It's a heart-probing warning before the sun sets, Jesus lays the hardness of their heart on the table for them to see. Here's four reasons why these religious leaders were rejecting Jesus as the son. Four costs involved in coming to Jesus. Broaden it out in application. Broaden it out. Four reasons why every unbeliever refuses to come to Christ so that they may have life. Let's focus on the first two this morning. Reason number one. Reason number one. People refuse to come to Jesus for salvation because the gospel requires you to slay all self-exalting pride. The gospel requires you to slay all self-exalting pride. Why are you will, unwilling to come to me? Verse 41 because I do not receive glory from men. Everything I say, everything I teach, everything I stand for is against what you, you religious leaders, value most. Here's what they valued. Self-promotion. Self-glorification. Self-exalting praise. 
If there's anything, anything that describes this group, it was self-glorification. It was man-centered praise. Listen to how Jesus refers to these leaders. He says this, beware the scribes. Why? Because they are the ones who like to walk around in long robes. So religious robes. They're normally worn on special occasions by the religious leaders. Here, they're wearing them out throughout the week. They're wearing them in public. They want to be noticed. They want to be pandered to. Oh, you are the religious ones. You are the righteous ones. Matthew adds that the leaders would even lengthen their tassels. They're flaunting their holiness. The longer the tassel, the greater the righteousness. That's the idea. They're lengthening them out so everyone can see just how righteous they are. They like respectful greetings in the marketplaces. They love to be called by exalted titles. They love the praise that comes from man. They loved all of this attention. And then you get into this public worship within the synagogues. They loved the chief seats in the synagogues. When the people would gather for worship, they wanted to be noticed. They wanted to be up front in the exalted chair. They're flaunting their own hypocritical righteousness. Why? So that they would be praised, esteemed, fawned over. Self-glorification. That's what they stood for. Jesus had these same leaders in mind when he says this, when you pray, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. Don't be like those religious leaders. Why? For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners. Here it is. So that they may be seen by who? By men. They want to be acknowledged. They loved the attention they found their satisfaction in people listening to their prayers. Sad, these prayers only reached the ears of men, not God. But they didn't care. God's not the audience. The people are. They loved every minute of it. But Jesus has a striking warning. He says this, Truly I say to you, they, those leaders, those hypocrites, they have their reward right now in this life. They have their reward in full. It's a damning statement. There's no reward in heaven for them. None. There's no heaven for them. Because heaven is barred from the proud. From the one who is satisfied with earthly praise from man. Temporal glory, human exaltation. This is why the religious leaders hated Jesus so much. They hated his gospel because he refused. He refused to give them the earthly praise they so much desired. Instead of exalting them, instead of flattering them, what does Jesus do? He brings them low. He unmasks their hypocrisy, unveils their depravity before God. This is what the gospel does. The true gospel exposes the pride of man by design. Why do they hate him so much? He is their savior. He is the son. Well, listen to what Jesus said about them. You can kind of understand. Matthew 23, woe to you. Here's a pronouncement of judgment. Woe to you. Judgment upon you, blind guides. Blind men, you blind men, you blind guides, you blind Pharisees. You get the point. You can't see rightfully spiritually. You believe your own headlines. You believe your own hypocrisy. But in order to come to me, you must realize that you are, in actuality, spiritually blind. You need to confess that. 
Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. You might be beautiful on the outside. You've, you've washed your robes today. You have clean tassels. But I see your heart. It's wicked, it's dead. John 10, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil. He refused to stroke their pride. Never does he do, do that. Why? Why does Jesus not do this? Because pride, it's the exaltation of self, the infatuation with self that bars sinners from heaven. Understand that. Pride bars sinners from heaven. You cannot come to Christ while exalting yourself. It's impossible. It's impossible. Drop down to verse 44. John 5, 44. Notice what Jesus says. He'll put it in the form of a question. How can you believe? How can you believe anything that I've said about myself? How can you believe my gospel? How can you come to me? How can you believe my glory? When you receive glory from one another, when you're filled with yourself, when you desire exaltation from man, when all you care about is man-centered and temporal, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Notice that last phrase there. The glory that is from, that comes from the one and only God. Jesus is not speaking of seeking in order to bring God glory. That's not what he's saying. He's saying there's someone who's going to receive glory from God, receive praise. It's a play on words. Jesus is referring to that future day when the Father welcomes all of his own into his presence. When the Savior says, well done, good and faithful servant. When the saved sinner receives praise, glory, call it this, reward, exaltation from God. That's an amazing thought. And Jesus says here the two are mutually exclusive. On one side, the religious hypocrites. On one side, there's the proud, self-exalting, self-satisfied person. He's satisfied with his own pride being stoked in this life. He's seeking praise from men now. He's receiving his glory. But on the other side, there's one who's been humbled by God. Humbled by the Son. Humbled by the gospel. Convicted of his own sinfulness before God. And Jesus says the humble one, that humble one is the one, though he did not receive praise from men in this lifetime, he will receive better praise. Better praise later. Praise from God. Glory from God. Reward from God. There's two people. Those who seek the praise from men, those who seek the praise from God. And so Jesus, with those two people in mind, asks the question, how can you believe how, when you receive, when you seek glory from one another, it's rhetorical. You can't truly believe. This is why you're rejecting me. You can't come to me because you are proud to your core. You love your pride. You love yourself. You will not deny yourself. Why will they not come to him? Because the gospel of Jesus had nothing their proud heart wanted. Nothing. The gospel of Jesus actually enrages the proud heart. It infuriates it. Who's the gospel of Jesus for? Who's it for? Well, Jesus explains it's for the poor in spirit. Not the proud in spirit. Not the self-exalting heart. 
one who recognizes he has nothing to offer God. Nothing at all. He's spiritually bankrupt before the Lord. He confesses that. He admits that. And so he comes to Christ. Christ is the only Savior. The Savior that he needs, he recognizes. The gospel of Jesus is for the one who mourns over his sin. These religious leaders didn't mourn over their sin. They covered it up. The gospel of Christ is for the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. And they know they need a righteousness outside of themselves. A righteousness only God can give. So they hunger for this. They long for it. If you are looking to be exalted now, if you are looking to be exalted now, if you are looking to be flattered now, if you are looking to be applauded by man, if you're looking to exalt your own ego, the gospel of Jesus is not for you. It has nothing to offer you. Because the gospel of Christ is a humbling gospel. It's about a glorious son. It's meant to des design to shatter your pride. It will never feed your pride. The religious leaders should have known this. They should have known this. Jesus is not saying anything they had not read before. This is Old Testament gospel in a nutshell. Listen to Psalm 34, 18. The Lord, Yahweh, is near to who? The brokenhearted. Not the self-exalting. He's near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 138, Yahweh regards the lowly, but the haughty, the self-absorbed, he knows from afar. They'll never stand in his presence. They are far away from him. How about Isaiah 57? For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place. I'm the only one exalted here. If you want to exalt yourself, you're not for me. I'm the only exalted one. And I dwell with those who are contrite and lowly of spirit. What's the principle? Pride goes before what? Destruction. That's the principle. So the first reason Jesus says these religious leaders are rejecting him, why all men reject the gospel when they reject Christ, is not because of a lack of information. It's not because of a lack of evidence. It's not because of a lack of proof on his part. He's presented all of that. He's persuaded them with that. No, it's because the gospel of Jesus doesn't stroke their self-exalting pride. Men and women reject the gospel because it takes aim at their infatuation with themselves. It calls them to deny themselves, deny all the greatness you once thought you possessed. Deny it all. To slay all self-exalting arrogance and conceit. And accept what Jesus says, what the gospel says about you. You're spiritually bankrupt. You're spiritually blind. You're desperate for forgiveness. You're powerless to earn that kind of righteousness demanded by God. To recognize all of that and then this, come to Christ. Come to him. He grants forgiveness to those who come. But these religious leaders, sadly, counted the cost, but it was too much. It was just too much. It's tragic. Jesus says the proud will never receive the glory, verse 44, the glory that is from the one and only God. It's the tragedy, just listen, the tragedy of trading the glory of eternal heaven for the temporal glory from fickle man. It's a tragedy. Coming to Christ means you are humbled by his message. 
you slay all self-exalting pride. There's a second reason, Jesus says, men and women refuse to come to him. Second reason, these religious leaders are rejecting Jesus and his gospel. Reason number two, people refuse to come to Jesus for salvation because the gospel requires you to turn from all godless loves. The gospel requires you to turn from all godless loves. Continue in verse 42. Jesus looks out, he says, but I know you. I'm your judge. Here's my verdict. I know you. That you do not have the love of God, that love for God in yourselves. That is a striking statement given who Jesus is talking to. Back in chapter 2, we saw the same kind of knowledge. Jesus looks into the heart of man and On his part, he's not entrusting himself to them. Why? He knows all men. He knows your heart. He can't be fooled. So here, I know you. I'm not fooled by any of you. You might fool the people. They might gawk at you. Your long robes, your extended tassels. But here's the truth. You do not love God. You do not love God. You don't love him from your heart where it matters. Again, it's an issue of the will, the heart on the inside. In your heart, there's other loves that reside there, stronger loves, greater loves. There's great application here, great application, especially for us who confess the glory of Christ. We need to examine our own hearts, don't we? These leaders, they had a love for God on their lips. They had a love for God on their lips. They claimed to love the Lord. Every morning and evening, they affirmed their love for God by reciting the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, with all your strength. They said that every morning, every evening. Jesus looks at them and says, you do not love God. Despite what you claim, despite your prayers. They wore their love for God on their hands, on their heads. They put on their phylacteries, little boxes tied to their foreheads, to their hands. They had written texts of the Old Testament inside those boxes. Here's what one of those texts was. Deuteronomy 11. Love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart. Jesus says you wear it on your head, you wear it on your hand. You don't love him. They claim to love God, but Jesus says their love was elsewhere. They had a greater love. More important love. Love for God was everywhere else but where it needed to be. It was not inside their hearts. And mark this, where love for God is not primary, where love for God is not primary, love for everything else will take its place. Back at John 3, they loved darkness rather than light. They loved their sin. Matthew 6, they love to stand and pray. They love their hypocrisy. Matthew 23, they love the place of honor at banquets. They loved all of it. They didn't love God. They loved their place of influence. They loved the money they would extort from the people. They loved the greetings they got in the marketplaces. They did not love Yahweh exclusively primarily with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, how did Jesus know this? How did Jesus know they did not love the Father? Look at verse 43. It's because they refused to love him, God's Son. I have come 
in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. So true love for the Father always shows itself in a love, an exclusive love for his Son, for Christ. The two are always tied together, the Father and the Son. Look at verse 23. Same thing with honor. Verse 23, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Same is true here. If you do not love the Son, you do not love the Father who sent him. The faith that saves, the faith that saves is the faith that loves the Father through the Son primarily and exclusively. It's not just love. It's not just claimed love, said love. It's an exclusive love with the heart on the inside. This is exactly what Jesus says later on in his ministry. It's so probing. Just listen. He who loves father or mother more than me. Fill in the blank. He who loves anything else more than me, your job, your goals, your wants, your money, your sin, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He can't come to me. That's what Jesus requires in order to come to him. You turn from all godless loves. You love the Father through him, through Christ, exclusively with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. J.C. Ryle writes this. A deep principle is contained in the saying of our Lord's and one that deserves special attention. True faith does not depend merely on the state of man's head and understanding, but on the state of his heart. His mind may be convinced, his conscience may be pricked, but so long as there is anything the man is secretly loving more than God, there will be no true faith. Look what Jesus says in verse 43. It's so sad. If another comes in his own name, if another one comes to you religious leaders, not sent by the Father, not commissioned, not the true Son, watch this, you will receive him. If you don't receive me, I humble you. You'll receive the one who exalts you. You reject me, the true son. I've given you all the evidence. But there's coming a day when you will receive the false messiahs. All of them. Again, the people, the reason people reject Jesus is not because of a lack of evidence. It's exactly what unfolds throughout, Jesus, throughout Israel's history, post-Jesus. No less than 63 men came on the scene, all claiming to be the promised Messiah. 63. All of them were received by Israel to one degree and another. Why? Why? Because they offered the people what they wanted. They offered them what they wanted. They offered the people what they loved most. You want military victory over Rome? We'll promise that. You want wealth? You want money? We'll promise you that. The people loved it. These false messiahs offered it. Every single one of those messiahs failed to deliver the promise. Every one. On and on it goes. You have the lists of all of these false messiahs. Acts 5, 36 gives two of these messiahs, but again, there's 61 others that come on the scene. It's just so tragic. The Messiah is in their midst. They do not receive him. They refuse to be humbled by him. The parallel really is amazing. Sinners will reject the true gospel, that, but they'll receive every other gospel out there, right? The gospel of man-centered purpose. They'll receive that. 
the gospel of temporal blessing, the gospel of personal achievement, the gospel of man-centered praise. All of them come, they are received, but not the true Christ, not the true Savior. Why? Because the cost is just too high. They did not have the love of God in themselves. It's a tragedy that plays out every single day. True gospel is heard. Forgiveness of sin is promised. Reconciliation with God is offered. The call goes out there, turn to Christ, come to him. But make sure you come to him on his terms, according to his cost. And so people reject it. They would rather love their own sin. They would rather love their own comfort, love their own families more than God, their own jobs more than God. Self-centered dreams, aspirations more than God, the true God. And in so doing, they reject the only Savior from sin. so easy to apply this to everyone else, right? Ask this question of yourself. Have you truly come to Jesus Christ? Or do you consider the cost just too high a price to pay? Have you truly come to him? Have you counted the cost? Come to Christ. Come to Christ. He will save you, but come to him on his terms. Be humbled by his gospel. And love him supremely with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We'll pick it up here next week. Father, you have a glorious son. And through the power of your spirit, you can change our hearts to be filled with faith and repentance that comes to him. Perform that work this morning. May you receive the praise you deserve, the love from us that you deserve. Convict us where necessary, that is our prayer. Grow our love for you. Bring us even lower in humility by exalting yourself, not us. That we praise you with all of our life. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.